Well, it's, it is my pleasure to welcome all the participants today for the first of, uh, uh, the first of this year series of online seminars, uh, which came as a result of our postponement of the conference, which takes place every March, every year, every March. But this year has been, has been postponed, as you know, as a result of the pandemic. Um, so, uh, so we, we, as a response or as a commitment to our delegates, our conference community, so we, we, we are organizing a series of seminars. The, the next one will be on the 17th of September. So please mark it on your diary on the 17th of September. Uh, so, and all good news come at once. So uh, yesterday, the conference chair has been uh, appointed president of the university, and he sends regards to all participants. So uh, welcome again to our first online seminar. And without you, I would like to call on Dr. Richard Jackson to, to start uh, the, the, the seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mustafa. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to, this is a, uh, an INCLUDE event, the International Collaboratory for Leadership in Universally Designed Education. Uh, and we're, we're really pleased to be here working with the University of Ivan Zor and this um, uh, conference that unfortunately got uh, postponed. Uh, with the pandemic. So uh, today we have a, um, we, we think a really uh, powerful uh, series of speakers. Uh, topic is courage to share. Uh, what INCLUDE is about these days is really ensuring that uh, the voice of the student comes to the fore. Uh, we're all about uh, participatory leadership and building a community of learners through a community of practice uh, type model. A collaboratory is a center without walls. Uh, instead of uh, thinking of a particular place where people congregate, we're concerned about scaling up universal design for learning to the global stage and what better way to do it than to have a, a center uh, that is virtual. And so uh, we welcome you to examine INCLUDE's uh, website and um, see how uh, the uh, content is being uh, developed out and how the content managers and steering, com steering committee members are, are really enacting on the uh, vision, the vision of, uh, of INCLUDE. Uh, I want to bring uh, Sean uh, Bracken uh, into this. Sean is going to introduce our speakers for today. And uh, Sean, are you there? I'm here, Richard. Thank you so much sure. for the invitation. And thanks, Mustafa, for the welcome, the virtual welcome from Morocco. Um, again, like that, I'd like to welcome everybody this afternoon. Um, uh, people from all over the globe, from France and from Morocco, from South Africa, from Chile, from uh, the UK, from Ireland and beyond. So you're all very, very welcome uh, to the INCLUDE event. Um, and as Richard has shared um, with a little bit of an insight into INCLUDE, our passion is to make and facilitate uh, equity in education and good quality education. So we're, we've got great synergies in our missions uh, between the University of Ibn Zor and uh, the collaboratory, the International Co Collaboratory for Leadership and Universally Designed Education. Um, and Richard and I were co-founders of, uh, of INCLUDE and um, launched it officially at, um, at the fourth, International. I think conference. it was the, the third internet. It has a long title. The third <laughs> international. No, I'm sorry. The third pan Canadian That's conference what it was. on universal design for learning. <laughs> yeah, that was it in in October uh, of last year on Vancouver Island in British Columbia in in Canada, um, and I think since then we've we've kind of grown from strength strength and, and had real opportunities to 
to share learning uh, and to invite other colleagues to come on board in terms of the collaboratory as well so that we can engage in research and strengthen the student voice. Um, and I suppose to add a dimension of uh, cultural sustainability in relation to inclusive practice as well and in regards to universal design and how we go about ensuring that universal design is culturally uh, appropriate within each one of the settings. And I think that kind of underpins the basis for the uh, narrative presentations that will be shared uh, by our colleagues. Um, so without further ado, Richard, over to you to introduce. Yes, well, I, well, I have the uh, pleasure of introducing first and foremost uh, a, uh, our student presenter. Um, and my, uh, my uh, pronunciation is uh, uh, Gislaine uh, Bohuli. And I'm sure I, I butchered your name. I did have, <laughs> uh, I did have the uh, pleasure of speaking with uh, Gislaine just before the meeting today. And I understand that she's a PhD student at the University of Ibanzor, and she is doing a dissertation on universal design for learning. How appropriate. So uh, we're really eager to hear uh, the voice of the uh, student researcher to kick off our session. Splendid. Over to you, Gislaine. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sean. Thank you, Dr. Richard. It's a pleasure to be with you here today and uh, to be a part of this wonderful uh, team. Uh, sorry. Uh, is it okay with my uh, screen? That's perfect. Very good. Uh, so uh, our uh, presentation is a short narrative of inclusive education uh, in North uh, African countries. I'm talking in behalf of uh, Dr. Mustafa Abi, my supervisor. Uh, I take this opportunity to thank him for uh, his support and help. Uh, so first, I would like to give you a brief background uh, uh, about inclusive education in North Africa. North African countries have made considerable progress in promoting inclusive education by ratifying UN conventions on the rights of persons with disabilities and enacting laws and reform in line with these conventions while inspired by inclusive models from developed countries, especially France. This is, this is a significant leap in policy given the unfavorable social and economic factors. In practice, the policy is far from reaching its intended goals due to a lack of clear pedagogical framework. Children are not often provided with the opportunities to succeed due to learning environments which lack the flexibility in the ways diverse learners can learn and be taught. I would like to particularly focus on the state of person with disability and take Morocco as an example. In Morocco, the prevalence rate of disability among children under the age of 50 or 15 is 1.8 percent. Only 30 percent of persons with disabilities have access to education. Of those who enter primary school, only 8.5 percent manage to continue to secondary school and while only 5% continue to higher education. Obviously, as it is, change is required. Change informed by research. There is a limited interest in research informed policy and practice in education. States' tendency to import ready-made Western formula rather than experience change driven by locally research-based evidence. On an anecdotal note, my co-author and supervisor was very disappointed with the poor performance of one of his students in the final exam, who, on the other hand, wrote outstanding interned assignments. He started to question the authenticity of her some assignments until when they start the student blog, and she wrote an amazing piece that he learned that she is dyslexic. She most likely must have problems with memorization of the large course content and exam time pressure. And, did, uh, and there are many other examples like her who, 
if given the appropriate environment suitable for their needs, that the UDL framework offers can certainly do better. So, can UDL influence education in North, in North Africa? UDL seeks to include those involved in the process of change and therefore can be locally relevant. The UDL approach will avoid the pitfalls of imposed change by allowing individuals within their learning community to influence and come to terms with change. We believe that UDL offers an opportunity for a bottom-up change process in education driven by emergent researchers in North Africa. Indeed, we are very happy that UDL research has taken momentum among doctoral students at our university, since it has been introduced by colleagues from INCLUDE to our university. And thank you. So, thank you. Can you hear me out there? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Shislin. Uh, really, really interesting and thought-provoking ideas. Um, just to kind of grab one or two of them, I, I, I love that concept of uh, the necessity for, for local research as opposed to drawing on ready-made Western concepts. I think that's vitally important. And I think part of the network is to, to encourage links uh, across the Global South in particular, so, the, so that we have researchers in the Global South who are collaborating with one another and supporting one another in relation to the research and the application or not of particular Western frameworks. So thank you so much. A great way for us to, thought provoking way for us to, to start with the panel discussions this afternoon. Can I encourage colleagues to um, uh, share their concepts in the chat box on the side? We also have uh, Verna Rossi, um, who is our, one of our advocates out there, and she is busily tweeting away at Include 2020 and at Isaac Conference. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's at Isaac Conference. Um, so just uh, ensure that uh, you're, you're making your own voices heard on the side panel as well and through the Twitter forum. That would be absolutely superb. Okay, so moving from... Can you um, unmute your screen? Yeah. Unmute. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Show your screen. <laughs> okay. You're, right. You're just there. You're just there in name. But I. Think okay, you, that's fine. You would ask, and I neglected to do this. You would ask me to make sure <laughs> that uh, I know that it's my handsome face there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, great. You, you would ask me to uh, encourage people to keep their mics and their uh, cam cameras uh, as uh, during the presentations and. I uh, neglected to do that. That's so fine. They've, they've, they've been doing a splendid job of uh, of self-regulating themselves out there anyway, so in terms of their videos. So so those people who are not presenting, if you wouldn't mind muting your videos until it's an op opportunity to do so, that would be great. Sometimes it can be a little bit distracting. Um, and uh, moving from North Africa to the other a tip of the continent to South Africa and to our esteemed colleague uh, Aisha Abdul Sattar. And uh, Aisha, I leave your story over to yourself and, and very uh, excited to hear it. Over to you. Okay, uh, good afternoon, colleagues. I think it's morning in some places of the world. Um, let me share my screen first. Okay, can you all see my screen? All right. Um, my name is Aisha Dusita from South Africa. I should tell you that South Africa is a country in the southernmost tip of the African continent. And the history of South Africa is steeped in discrimination and exclusion due to the legacy left behind of its low uh, colonial custodians that later led to the unjust apartheid system. The remnants of these inequities still plague the country after its transition to democracy. And today, I've built up the courage to share the narratives from South African higher education. Okay, all, 
although all people of color were discriminated against, people with disabilities have been affected the most. What we see is that people with disabilities have always been excluded from society, and culture also plays a role in that. Uh, we have the the government system that created special schools for people with disabilities, so people were basically excluded from um, mainstream society. And culture plays a role where, a role where people are discouraged from actually ex, uh, exposing or disclosing their disability status. So the effect of this exclusion has been even more profoundly felt uh, in the rural areas. Although the newly formed government is fairly young, it's about 26 years old, and the new constitution of South Africa has been adopted and advocates inclusion in all spheres of the citizenry, we see that many, many policies have been put into place, but we still see a lot of issues and a lot of transformation that needs to take place, especially in terms of practical application. So how do we create opportunities in terms of creating diversity, uh, encouraging diversity, inclusion, and access? See, there is a call for encouraging the participation of persons with disabilities in society, that is in employment and education. And the government has also created policies uh, and, and policies in this regard. But impl implementation is a problem, like I've said before. So advocacy groups have been actively pursuing an implement, uh, implementation of this strategy for the inclusion of persons with disabilities, which has seen some progress up to date. But how does this translate into uh, the university system? All right. So my interest in this area actually started as a, a young child. The learning activities for, for each school term was based on the theme. And one of these themes that we actually focused on was disabilities. And the school arranged a trip to a local center for persons with disabilities. And this is when I've seen the stark realities of people with disabilities and how they've been actually excluded from society. So that's where my interest started. And uh, interestingly enough that I've joined higher education as well as a lecturer and, I try, and I've been uh, actively involved with students with disabilities since I actually had a student with disability coming in to me asking for some assistance. So this is what I've also seen at universities and at my university. Uh, I am a lecturer at the University of South Africa, which is the largest open distance and e-learning university in Africa. So uh, our, we are actually there to try and create a balanced society and to transform society and try to integrate people within the education especially higher education system, and to change society in that way, moving from higher education, obviously, to workspaces and living spaces. But what I've seen is that although we have a fantastic advocacy center, what we do see is that uh, things are done from the back end. And, and this is a bit of a problem. So especially now with the digitization of education and students with disabilities, we're seeing that everything's moving online. So many times students with disabilities do not even disclose their disability status. So many of our programs do not cater for students on the online platform with disabilities. So how do we deal with this? This is something that needs to be dealt with and this is what we're working on uh, at the university at the moment and we're uh, busy working on a project involving the digitization of education and online systems and catering for students with disabilities, especially students who do not disclose their disability status. Although we have great support systems for them from the back end, it's not working from the front end. So what am I advocating for? I'm advocating for increasing access, inclusion, transformation, especially in this digital age, and how does that work? So uh, we need to actually create greater support systems, greater accessibility of our online systems for students from the front end. So we need to design forward and instead of designing backward. And this is the project that I'm involved in at the moment with the university in the digitization of the university, 
working towards transformation and disability. So how, we, how do we actually transform the university by creating access and inclusion for students with disabilities? And this is where universal design uh, of learning comes into place. Although we see that many learning materials are converted into accessible formats, but how do we do that on digital platforms from the front end? And these are things that we need to work on. And these are things that we are working on. So important aspects here are digital access, digital literacy, which are important aspects. And within this framework, the need to understand the socioeconomic realities of the people in the country and the region which is in for, important in transforming education to be more inclusive because we see people being excluded by design. Many of our people have really poor socioeconomic realities, which excludes them from the digital platforms. They live in areas without digital access, so they don't even have uh, access to technologies, and those that do do not know how to use these platforms, how to actually use accessible uh, features for themselves. So these are things that we are working on, and these are narratives that we need to actually uh, have with students. And these are the narratives we need to include into our uh, approaches to curriculum design. So this is what I am uh, advocating for, is thinking of the UDL framework as an overarching guide in an effort to promote inclusive practices that would go beyond the classroom and filter into our working and living spaces. We need to engage more with students to make their narratives heard and understood so these voices inform our approaches to curriculum design. Okay, thank you. Over to Sean. Oh, thank you so much, Aisha. That was just a really fabulous uh, and thought-provoking presentation. I think uh, what, what really grabbed me, there's a couple of points that really grabbed me from that. Um, the first one is, is the notion of multiple attributes of marginalization and how they can compound uh, an individual's uh, sense of, of, uh, inaccess of, of, of the uh, access to, to education having particular barriers and challenges put in place, whether it's about gender issues or whether it's about uh, racial identities and, and, as you mentioned, disabilities as well, and how they interface with socioeconomic factors. I think really important attributes for further research, and I think that those are hopefully resonating with some of the uh, listeners here today and, and prompting some thoughts about uh, how best we can engage with those particular learners in, or, in order to overcome those challenges um, and consistently work towards uh, universal provision that is equitable and just. Thank you so much for that. And um, again, I'd like to encourage people to keep those uh, concepts uh, being explored in the chat box. We'll share those um, uh, chat uh, discussions following the sessions afterwards. So um, from the continent of Africa to the continent of America, North and South, and, um, and moving to Chile uh, for our next uh, speaker, who is Christina Bosch. And uh, Christina and I haven't met as yet. Uh, we met virtually at the conference in October, and uh, where we introduced the notion of include, and Christina was an, an immediate convert to the idea of uh, the ecological and sustainability and looking at, at, at uh, cultural sustainability in particular and social justice as an attribute of universal design for learning. So, Christina, I don't want to be taking up your space, your uh, virtual space this afternoon. We're really keen to hear your story because I know it's a, a, a multi-textured uh, and layered story. So over to you. Thanks, John. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to actually try to just at the last minute throw some images in here along with my presentation. It's probably not going to be the smoothest view, um, so bear with me. Um, but I realized it was really a more UDL way of going about my introduction. So you're going to just be seeing this image of my screen, I realize it's not the full thing, but I think it'll help. 
Uh, Christina, do you have? Are you, you you're using Google Slides right there, right? Yeah. And, and sorry for jumping in, but hey, no, thank you. You know, <laughs> why not? Right? This is. Yeah. I think we've we've got uh, we've got about thirty uh, participants in here, so I think there's scope for improvis- improvisation and innovation as Great. we as we go through this. Great stuff. So, I, I, without throw without being um, hopefully. Uh, too, too difficult. I'd like to throw a little curveball your direction. Um, and that's my, I'm using my Americanisms here. No problem. And that one is to see if you can put your closed captions on with your, with your Google Slides. Sure. How I can I do that? Um, and if anybody wants to jump in in relation to kind of closed captionings. I can jump in. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah. I, I <laughs> that's should. fine if you click at the bottom you'll get a little uh, a little uh, ribbon at the bottom uh, no leave close close that drop down uh, menu yeah at the bottom you should get uh, you know the one that says start your presentation it has the closed captioning there as well okay begin the presentation okay present, present. from beginning okay present from beginning yes now you'll see there's a cc point here oh, why doesn't yours have that Go into settings, start again, present. It might be an add-in, Ashia, in this. Maybe. A, a it's an add-in, yes. Yeah. It's not on hers. Uh, on hers uh, it could be in the settings, though, when you when you click down the bottom. Yeah. And, and I think it's worth our while doing this, because what, what this does, Christina, if I'm not upsetting you too, too much. No, not at all. This is great. Great. It, it actually encourages other people to, to look at the functionality of, um, of some of the tools that are available, such as in OneDrive or in, in Google Slides, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, what, what, what we can do is, um, yeah, hopefully they'll start coming on board. But not not to worry. I'll I'll. And sorry for disrupting your your presentation. We, we let's let's leave it like this: that people know that now that Google Slides has that functionality available. And if you go to your settings there on that, it might work actually. Just a little wheel. Uh, Here. Little wheel. Yeah. No, I don't think so. Which is a bit of a shame, but anyways, you oh. can you can download a, a, a closed captioning just to, so that um, other colleagues can can follow along in, in the script form as well. But worth the try. But and sorry for throwing you off kilter a little bit. No, um, no problem at all. And thank you for doing that. <laughs> I I did just sort of throw these images together in our in the ten minutes before we started our presentation at uh, a half an hour ago. So. Um, I also should have been better prepared, but um, thank you for jumping in. Thank you for using it as a, a hope. This was also a teachable moment for everybody else. Um, I'm going to stick with it like this, because if I go into presenter mode, I can't see my notes. And so, as I said, you know, I know y'all are seeing my full um, screen with the thumbnails and stuff on the left, but I just thought some visuals would help with my introduction. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, my name is Christina Vosh. Um, I am a doctoral student. Um, I'm doing my uh, dissertation at University of Massachusetts Amherst in the U.S. I got a Fulbright and was living in Chile for over a year to do my dissertation research. And I actually came back um, because of COVID. I was born by the East River, which is pictured here. It's actually an uh, a salt water tidal estuary connecting the upper New York Bay to the Long Island Sound, both of which mix into the Atlantic Ocean. I grew up in an urbanized marsh, uh, originally home to the Piscataway peoples, land that was shaped by the Rock Creek watershed near where it drains into the Potomac River, which empties into the Chesapeake Bay, an inlet of the Atlantic Ocean in the Northern Hemisphere. Now known as Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States, my ancestors crossed this same ocean, the Atlantic. Some arrived in Vermont, Massachusetts, others in New York, all made their lives on this rocky and sandy North American coast. Other ancestors of mine sailed out of the Golfo de Vizcaya, pictured here, and maybe even Malvalear and through the Strait of Gibraltar, crossed the equator and sailed up 
the Rio de la Plata and into Buenos Aires, Argentina, where they would continue traveling over land, crossing the Andes until settling in Santiago, Chile. This colonial capital is traversed by the Rio Mapocho, which starts on the mountain Plomo and then flows into the Rio Maipo, a life-giving river that drains ultimately into the Pacific Ocean. This introduction of mine that I just tried out on you all, thank you, <laughs> um, is inspired by bioregional philosophy, which is a reaction against the environmental consequences of unchecked globalization and capitalism that seeks to reconnect people to the natural systems that surround and sustain them. It is actually an example of how UDL has come to inform my work. One of the most powerful contributions of UDL to education, especially from my international perspective, is its unwavering emphasis on context. As a teacher, I learned to hone in on certain guidelines through a consideration of context, taking into account the instructional content, the week, the time of the day, the layout of the room, my knowledge and skills, and how all these combined with the individual characteristics of students. The learning environment is full of complexity that tends to be flattened by the narrowness of special education and a very monolithic idea about disability that is characteristic of special education in the U.S., I would say. Or there's high stakes testing on content or accountability policies and, and regulations of behavior. Without UDL, we can suffer from a sort of inattentional blindness when you can't see what's in plain sight because you're so focused on something else. In the same way that bioregionalism seeks to remedy the separation between urbanized humans and the ecosystems that we are often unwittingly destroying, UDL reconnects the web of relationships that constitute learning by imbuing learning environments with enough flexibility to sustain diversity and thus reduce the damage that exclusionary schooling can cause. As disorienting as it might be to introduce ourselves according to the ecosystems that grew us rather than through neat geopolitical borders, internalizing universal design inverts my conceptions of education by separating learning from tradition. In international work, the context is all the more important to visibilize, especially when someone like me is crossing cultures and borders. While UDL initiatives I think should share a universal focus on creating inclusive environments that reframe, reframe learning, teaching, expertise, and disability, as well as ability. Each implementation ought to reflect a distinctive adaptation within the unique ecologies of different societies and education systems. I'm now back in the US um, for the time being. <laughs> thinking about the ways in which international policies on inclusion allow for a multiplicity of definitions and approaches to achieving equitable learning opportunities for all. On the one hand, this is exactly what I think we need, recognition of and respect for differences, flexibility, adaptation, and dialogue between local and global phenomena. On the other hand, the multiplicity of meanings contained within one word like inclusion means that it can be a moving target making it difficult to achieve in terms of long-term life outcomes. This is one of the strengths, I think, of UDL. Its specificity and clarity make it precise and transferable, while its underlying emphasis on variability in context reminds us that we cannot be agnostic about context, global and local, and the patterns of discrimination in each. After universal education is achieved in a territory like Chile, there's this term in Spanish, inclusión excluyente, exclusionary inclusion, um, can be the next challenge. Access to education without changes in the learning environment, right, allows exclusion to persist. A great example of this right now in the U.S. is seen in the Black Lives Matter platform and movement. We are in the midst of this major social equity movement here, as they are, or, you know, in Chile, prior to the pandemic lockdowns. And now being in the U.S., I'm in one of the epicenters of the COVID-19 crisis. So here now I'm explicitly seeking to connect UDL and the idea that it is a moral imp imperative and socially just approach to education. I'm trying to connect that to the leadership and visions of people from multiply marginalized communities um, in the Americas in particular. And importantly, I think I'm using UDL to interrogate my positionality 
my self-awareness and my motives, particularly as someone whose body represents many forms of hegemony. I have two quick illustrations of this, which I'm building on as I teach students remotely this semester. And I'm tracking my time, and I know I used a little bit in the beginning, so I'll go quick. But um, first, I just think it's really important for me to say that, as was previously mentioned by, I think, both previous speakers, UDL paired with culturally responsive strategies um, is essential. And an awareness of those, as well as the context that I'm in, has shown me that I actually center myself in a lot of my work. I think this is normal and perhaps largely unavoidable, though with intentionality and time, change is hopefully inevitable. But what I mean by this is my passion for teaching and learning, my toolbox of academically and experientially informed pedagogical tools, and my beliefs about the importance of the content I teach all need to make room for the pragmatic realities of my students, especially right now. In one of my most recent teaching experiences, I was working with young Spanish dominant Puerto Rican mothers who had dropped out of school and were working to do their high school equivalency exam. I was doing all sorts of cool classes, trauma informed, project based learning, you know, um, experiential arch integration stuff until I realized that my students actually wanted time with worksheets, which was really surprising for me. But um, I realized through talking with them that worksheets, worksheets was what the English dominant classes were doing. And while I didn't think it was best practices instructionally, um, doing all the sort of interactive lessons that were driven by UDL that I was designing was actually making my students feel really othered because the other classes were doing primarily worksheet based work. So in this instance, culturally responsive UDL instruction meant that I had to mix and balance and center what I thought was the best approach with what my students needed in order to reduce and minimize threats and distractions in their learning. And just to close, you know, now I'm teaching a, a large introduction to special education class over Zoom, and I'm realizing that the students that I'm working with have so much going on during this pandemic that I need to use UDL to address the wide variety of engagement needs and at the same time be really flexible about what students are able to give this class after I've made um, universally designed adjustments and considerations. Um, I know that in Chile, for example, students have been protesting consistently since March about the way that the pandemic and the lockdowns and virtual learning have affected the education that many of them pay for. And in some ways, I'm waiting for my students in the U.S. to mobilize that kind of consciousness um, and connect it to the current context, which is this struggle for equity that we see surging now here and, frankly, it seems all over the world. But um, I would just conclude by saying that, yeah, for me right now, UDL and culturally competent instruction means really finding, you know, ways to consistently check my own centering of myself and my teaching and putting students' needs alongside that. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Christina. And um, I'm sure you'll be able to respond uh, to uh, Verna's request for your Twitter handle. I think um, she's very keen to contribute to, to your discussions. And thank you for a super rich and thought-provoking uh, 10, 15 minutes, which has really enriched our lives. I'm, I work with a colleague in Brazil, uh, Elizabeth uh, Chris, uh, Christina, and she speaks about multi-temporalities as well, which, I, which you prompted me to think about, just the flexibilities around time and our necessities to, to reevaluate our conceptions around time, particularly from kind of Western perspectives and, and how, and I, and I think you've kind of enriched that concept in relation to um, life pathways in relation to narrative and, and how narrative interfaces with, with geography as well. It's so really very, very, and history, so really very, very rich um, overview of where, to, where you've come from in terms of uh, history and where, where you currently are and ultimately the visions that you have. And thank you so much for sharing those. Um, I want to move from Chile and uh, the East River and take you over to 
uh, Canada and uh, to early morning, early enough morning to, to visit with uh, Dave Stinton, who has played a critical role in, in Clues thus far, and uh, in, particularly in, re- in relation to the development of our action-oriented values for Include. And if you haven't had an opportunity to tap into those action-oriented values, can I ask you to please start there? Because they're a font, and we, we consistently dip uh, from that font and, and enrich ourselves with that font of, uh, of really reflective ideas that Dave has shared. But I, I, I'll pass over to Dave now, hopefully. Are you, are you with us, Dave? Yeah, I'm here. Excellent. And, and can I encourage other uh, colleagues, if you wouldn't mind, to mute your microphones uh, whilst Dave shares his story? Over to you, Dave. Thank you, and thank you for the chance to do this. When Initially, when uh, Sean uh, sent this stuff out, uh, my understanding was that we were supposed to write a piece on kind of what drew us into UDL and into, uh, subsequently for me, into uh, the Include organization. So this is what my piece is. It's not very academic at all, but it's a bit of my story. So I'll read it so that I just kind of go through it really well. I often wonder why things are the way they are and how we might design better systems. Universal design and universal design for learning challenges me to employ the best design possible to meet the needs or goals that we have in mind. I grew up in Africa and moved to Canada when I was 16 years old. All of my post-secondary education has been in North America, and one of the disciplines that I've used regularly is to ask, would this work in Ethiopia? That's where I grew up. This always gave me at least two viewpoints as I thought about what I was learning. It also gave me a deep desire to design well, to endorse uh, designs that have much broader usefulness than designs that are based on a monocultural perspective. And I've come to believe that access and inclusion are aspects of really good functional design. My brother-in-law is a car guy. And so over the years, I've asked him which cars he thought were the best because I wanted to buy good vehicles. Uh, And he always would answer in the same way. He would ask me, well, what do you want to use the car for? And I actually hated that question because really what I was asking was, What car has everything I want? So I'm looking for something that's fast and sporty, something that's reasonably priced, something that's really reliable, good on gas, able to hold a family of five, and then when we go on vacation to, excuse me, include all sorts of other stuff. So really what I was asking for was what's the perfect car for me, but in many different contexts and circumstances. As I reflect on the process of design, I realize that a lot of choices were made back in a design phase. If I want a car that is good on gas, it will probably be smaller, have a smaller engine that probably won't be very fast. So you get the picture. There's no way I get everything I want in a car. And on one hand, universal design is great because the emphasis is on uh, having a really wide um, scope, but it also means that we have to look at our, our function and what we want the function to be. So great design provides the most benefit for the widest group of people without sacrificing the purpose of the design. The point is that when designing structures from buildings to learning environments, great design articulates priorities and purposes that and then form follows function to develop the design. So my passion is to design well and to create frameworks that everyone can use, but that provide ways that people can personalize the design to their circumstances. I've found that UDL, uh, universal design and universal design for learning principles are very helpful for designing good systems. But I think there's more that could be done to articulate what good design looks like and how we can balance competing priorities. I see include as a mechanism where these things can be discussed on a global scale. 
Here are some of the things I've been thinking about lately. You'll notice there's no answers, but I, I, I end up thinking about and wondering, how can we do this better? How can we balance the need for broad inclusion with the need for specific and targeted interventions? Are there additional principles that could be added that would help uh, align diverse elements within an environment so that we are more effective designers? Number two, how do we design inclusive environments without dis diminishing a sense of identity and diversity? What principles would guide this balance? And then finally, the, uh, what UDL principles apply more broadly than simply to education and physical environments? Could they be applied, for example, to policy consultation and implementation? So uh, each one of the speakers to have broadened the thinking and said, could things apply in different ways? And that's kind of where I'm at and wondering how include as a, as a discussion point and as a global organization, how, how can we really enhance that and have those discussions? So that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that challenging last question, Dave. I really appreciate that. And, and it's a very timely one. And I, I don't think it just applies to include, actually. And it, it's also one that I know that CAST are currently grappling with in relation to the lived experiences of, of kind of marginalized communities more generally and the quest for social justice. And, and I think so it's, it's a really timely question to ask and a prompting one. And I know that there are, um, I've heard from Richard, actually, Richard Jackson, if you feel like jumping in here, Richard, in relation to this, please do. Um, ongoing discussions in CAST, or perhaps we leave it to our next speaker, uh, David, David Gordon, to discuss that. Uh, how, how best perhaps the new framework might, might address some of those really pertinent questions that you're asking, Dave. So, so thanks for kind of the analogy of the car. I quite like that. And I, and I wondered whether actually, um, we need to go somewhat electric and uh, sustainability sustainable in regards to our car choices as well um and that might constrain how far we can get out into the into the countryside for the moment but but hopefully we will reach that stage where universally we'll be able to 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 get Go electric, somebody has said to Richard. <laughs> so thank you so much for that thought-provoking and really interesting uh, view from Canada. And what we'll do is stay in North America and uh, join our colleague um, and esteemed publisher as well, who has written with um, Anne Meyer and uh, with David Rose. And we're really very, very fortunate to have uh, David Gilborn here. Our, with us, to David Gordon here with us this afternoon. Apologies, David. Over to you. Yes, thanks. I've been called worse, Sean, so don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, thank you all. It's, it's great to be with you. And we have a number of wonderful speakers, so I won't, uh, won't keep you too long. But in the reflections, uh, in my time reflecting on how I came into UDL and came to understand it. Uh, I was thinking about uh, uh, the fact that I grew up in a small town, Newport, Rhode Island, a uh, coastal city in New England that has a very rich history. And, uh, and uh, but it was a great place to grow up in that in the winter, it was a very small uh, town of about 25,000 people. And during the summer, this coastal uh, small city would swell to about 60,000. It would more than double in population. And that influx of summer people would include uh, uh, very wealthy, adventurous, and sophisticated people from all over the world. Because when I was a kid, the America's Cup uh, yacht races were held in Newport. The uh, the International Tennis Hall of Fame was located there. There were famous uh, Newport jazz and folk festivals. And um, so we townies, as we were known, would uh, get uh, exposure to uh, people who would come in from Europe and from Asia and from South America and all kinds of different parts of North America and uh, a wonderful experience. Uh, of uh, cosmopolitan life, of diversity, of variability, of experiences. 
Um, that only increased as I moved on to New York City and, and became a, a journalist uh, specializing in foreign affairs at, at Newsweek magazine for some years and later as a, a teacher of writing in post-secondary settings, uh, which gave me an appreciation for student differences. Uh, I found my way to CAST, really, as editor of the Harvard Education Letter. I was simply reporting on this new concept around the year 2000 called Universal Design for Learning. The term had just been coined recently by the folks at CAST, and I went out to see them in their offices to see what this was all about. And uh, I was immediately taken with... Uh, really, the con, a uh, couple of concepts, uh, and Christina Bosch, uh, alluded to one of them earlier, uh, that context is everything, that, that the learning context is so important, um, uh, in understanding how people learn, uh, how we define successful learning and all of that, and then a deep understanding and appreciation for the fact that uh, there may be multiple ways of being engaged, of representing information, et cetera. So I joined CAST. One of the first things that um, I noticed when uh, I joined CAST as uh, the first communications director uh, with a heavy emphasis on publishing and I got working with a 45-member consortium of education and disability rights organizations called the National UDL Task Force. It was brand new. Is that it was so important for us to um, come up with a language, with a vocabulary and a nomenclature and an understanding of what UDL is at the time, there were many different definitions floating around, uh, not the definition we commonly think of and refer to now with these three principles and a set of guidelines, and, a, and uh, now we have an understanding of what the framework is. But then the term was very uh, fuzzy still, and we had a lot of discussion about, so how do we build a movement, how do we talk about uh, the work we do in ways that uh, allow us to find common ground while also allowing for the very diverse uh, and variable expressions uh, of how this plays out in practice. And uh, so uh, in summary, I just give back to the group here and back to the field these couple of questions, these are questions I like to say that keep me up at night, that uh, as someone who's a communications person and a publisher, I really uh, have grappled with over the years and continue to grapple with. Number one, how do we develop and nurture a common understanding and vocabulary while still recognizing and celebrating the very diverse expressions of UDL throughout the world? And I think today we're seeing a wonderful celebration and recognition of those diverse expressions. Can we continue to find a common language? I think we can, while also honoring that difference. And then the second question, and I'll just stop with this, is uh, how can we ensure that UDL in action is authentic in each unique instantiation uh, rather than just a factory product of uh, some UDL template. So this is a big question for us as we're, we've put out a call recently to uh, rewrite the uh, and revise the UDL guidelines. Uh, by the way, we invite everyone to participate in that. Uh, we'll be putting a news announcement up uh, around that this week. But we really want to uh, both... Uh, keep the guidelines and the framework very current while also honoring the fact that everywhere UDL is put into practice, it's not going to be the factory model version of UDL. There is no factory. It's not coming mm -hmm. off an assembly line. The guidelines are not a, a checklist 
they are guidelines. And um, so how do we continue to encourage each other and continue to give each other the space as we put UDL into practice to really make this a vibrant tool for improving education for all? Thank you. Oh, sublime. Thank you, David. Just absolutely wonderful. I think if you've, what you've managed to do is to draw together the, to synthesize all of those questions that, um, that include ultimately have to engage with as well. And, uh, thank you for really clearly articulating what, what that core purpose is and, and, and ultimately using the framework, which I see behind you um, yes. <laughs> nicely positioned well done i'm well thought through um, <laughs> and and thinking about the, that as as guiding uh, principles uh, with uh, an international transnational and global uh, resonance and i think to some extent that that's what we're all grappling with and and it can yes. only be realized i think through uh through those personal experiences and through those academic experiences that colleagues have in community contexts and uh, and through research and i think what we can do consistently is to encourage um perhaps greater transnational research to ar- to arrive at some iterations as to uh, and clarity around what that actually looks like looks like in in particular practices and and then we can we can share what those essences of practice are but thank you so much for those really thought-provoking questions so we're going to move uh from uh africa and um the americas to um to europe Uh, richard did you want to jump in here real quick or did you have something that you wanted to, to add well, I'm mindful of the time, and I, I just wanted to uh, uh, thank David and thank everybody else. Uh, call people's attention to uh, the, the, the common theme going through today's event, that universal mm. design for learning is a framework for planning. But notice how it has such universal appeal. And yeah. Just, and that's, that's just what to keep in mind, everybody's presentation it's talking about a framework, but a local application. That's it. Great. That's Thanks. And I'm, that, I'm yeah. taking more time than I should. So. No, no, no. You're perfectly fine. And in fact, we, we had scheduled this in initially for 90 minutes. So we're, we're, you know, well on time here. So that's, that's great. But thanks to, for alerting us to that as well. So coming over more in my direction, I'm, I'm based in the UK at the University of Worcester and uh, maybe a little bit further north. And uh, the further north that we'll go is to Sweden. And I'd like to call on uh, my colleague, uh, Linda. Um, Planten Iwe. And I, I do apologize if I've uh, misnomered you, if I've, the pronunciation is, is incorrect, Linda, but um, I'm sure you'll do a, a splendid job in terms of your, sharing your narrative as well and uh, giving us the, the Swedish insight and perhaps alerting us to the conference which you have co- forthcoming as well. Over to you. I will. Thank you, Sean. And just like you said, my name is Linda Plantin Eve, and I am a PhD student in special education at Malmö University, Sweden. But I'm also a lecturer and a teacher educator at Kristianstads University, where I teach students that are becoming special needs teachers and senkos. And I am going to share my story with you. And it is a narrative which is is quite personal and not very academic at all. I grew up in the southern part of Sweden in a village with similar streets and similar houses. In each house lived a family with a mom, dad and children. The children played at the same playground and went to the same school where the classrooms looked almost the same, just like the teaching conducted a school where the teacher talked and the students listened, responding when asked to. The students were taught in the same way and at the same time, and the students who did not manage were separated and taught in different classrooms with a different teacher. And this was nothing that I was reflecting on. It was as it always had been. If a student did not learn, 
it was assumed to depend on student ability rather than teaching methods or circumstances in the learning environment. When growing up, I decided to become a teacher. The pre-understanding I had of the profession was the one that I was carrying with me from my own childhood, where the school was created and the students were adapted to fit. Even though school had been changed a lot since I went to school, they still had a good way to go before they could be considered as entirely inclusive. And my first employment was at a special school for children with neurodevelopmental disabilities. A school where all my previous understanding of teaching and learning was turned over. I rapidly understood that I could not teach all my students in the same way and expect them to reach the same goals at the same time. Nor could I assume that the students listened when I talked and answered when asked. And what would I do to attract my charming, wise, spirited and quite reluctant students to learning? Students who had repeatedly failed in meeting with school, students who came from different backgrounds with different experiences, students that repetitively had failed to manage school, sometimes rejected by teachers as well as peers. Students who no longer believed in themselves or their abilities. I must admit that my first week as a newly trained teacher with these students were quite shaky. And the first goal I set for myself was to get to know each individual student, creating a trusting relationship with each one of them in order to investigate how to motivate them into learning, as well as examining their strengths and areas of development. Somewhere during that work, I understood that it was not the students that needed to be changed to fit into school, neither was it the students that were to be differentiated. In fact, I realized that it was exactly the opposite. I realized that I was stuck with a pedagogy in desperate need of special support, a pedagogy that desperately needed to be differentiated instead of the students. Many years later, as a lecturer at Kruhansta University, I started to give lectures about UDL and accessible learning. I realized that all even if UDL was not yet widely known in Sweden, there were some individual schools as well as researchers that were interested in and based their work on the framework. And now interest is growing rapidly in Sweden, not at least, not least because of the web education that I, together with some of my colleagues at Kravansta University and in collaboration with the National Agency for Education, has created for Swedish teachers. And the web education is based on the principles for universal design for learning, which has resulted in a national spread of knowledge. And our work to disseminate in UDL is ongoing and we have just finished translating the framework into Swedish in order to increase the accessibility for Swedish teachers and the translation is to be published at CAS's homepage, which we of course is very proud of. Furthermore, Kristianstad University is the first Swedish university to host a UDL conference which will be held digitally in October this year, and where we are having Richard Jackson as our head keynote, which we also are very, very proud of. And the conference aims to, apart from disseminating knowledge about UDL, also creating a Scandinavian network. By spreading knowledge about UDL, we hope to take yet another step towards an increased accessibility for all Swedish teachers and students by creating schools that fully embraces diversity. A school that, just like an amoeba, adapts to students' needs instead of the other way around. And I guess you can say that Sweden in many ways have reached far in the mission of creating an inclusive education. And it is clearly stated in both the school law and the curriculum that education can't be equally designed. Um, everywhere, and there must be different ways for students to reach their educational mm -hmm. goals. 
However, we still have a diverse education system where, for an example, students with intellectual disabilities are taught in special schools with a special curricula. And uh, even if the ambition are to include all students in the regular compulsory school, student with NDD, like I mentioned, my first uh, class when I was newly trained, they are still in some municipalities uh, gathered and uh, talked in uh, different and differentiated group. And we have to think of how this affects the students that no longer have relational accessibility to their peers and regular teachers. How does this affect their academic and social development when their relational context are taken away from them? So I guess you can say that we have a bit left before we can say that we are fully having a fully inclusive school and we think that UDL guidelines can uh, be a good framework uh, with us uh, to help us with this in this work. Thank you. Oh, that's sublime. Thank you so much, uh, Linda. Really, really interesting. And I think what you've managed to do there is to bring us back to the uh, mission, which was to to self-reflect and mm. to, to see our own particular roles and, and draw on narrative theory and how it's mm. really necessary to think about our own personal roles as well. And mm. I was mindful when, when you were speaking there of, of what that uh, challenge means for professionals. Mm. And I think one of the main areas is the necessity to consistently strive to professionalize ourselves mm -hmm. in regards to our understandings, not only of the UDL framework, uh, but its implications for, for cultural practice and mm -hmm. also its implications for uh, technological practice. And that was brought mm -hmm. home to many of us who participated in um, accessibility, uh, online accessibility, uh, yes. professional enhancement over the past few weeks, where to some extent there was a, a very strong realization that, that, we, we, that we needed to really strengthen our own skills in our understandings of what universal design meant uh, in practical terms. Um, so thank you so much for that challenge. And thanks for reminding us again of the power of narrative and how particular incidences in our lives can can assist us to transform the lives of learners. And I think that's that's the pivotal point. So um, I'm going to stay in Europe and uh, I'm going to shift a little bit further south and west. Thank you once again, Linda. And I'm going to uh, request my colleague, uh, that Tracy Galvin, come and join us from Queen's University in Northern Ireland. So Tracy, if you can come in and, um, and share your experiences, that would be wonderful. Yep, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can indeed. Great, so I'm just gonna follow suit like everybody uh, in front uh, the last few speakers and not put up any slides, if that's okay. So I suppose my title, I had, um, I was talking about crossing borders and I suppose this border, this invisible border at the moment in a tiny island in the west uh, of Europe is causing more trouble and breaking international laws at the moment and causing a lot of trouble with Brexit um, and trying to exit uh, Europe, basically. Um, so just to give a little bit of background about me, just going with the narrative theory, um, because a lot of the previous speakers have spoke about their own stories. And I actually do really believe that personal and your own story is really important because it's often, often the reason why we end up where we actually are and how I've chosen or how I've ended up um, working in the role that I'm working in. Um, I suppose like David, I was called a townie as well. Um, I grew up in Limerick City in an inner city um, estate and basically 
while you know it was I suppose considered as a as a disadvantaged community, we had very strong um, values, and I had a very strong um, mother figure uh, who also had a very strong work ethic. And it was all about education. Your whole, the way you could break a cycle was that you stay in education. It didn't matter whether you liked being in school or not liked being in school. But if you remained and you got the education, which at the time when I was doing it was the leave insert, um, that if you got that, no matter what, you, you would get work. So it wasn't, I suppose, in, in my generation, it would have been probably 50-50. Um, maybe 50% of my friends would have thought about some form of higher education, but equally the other 50% would have been just to go into the workplace, whatever whatever that meant. And I suppose it was kind of an open door policy. You kind of took care of everybody in, in, in that community. And yes, we were in a city, but it was a very close-knit community. Nobody ever went hungry or, or without and um, you basically had an open door policy and if there was a child hungry you could have had anybody walk in the door and your mother literally scraped off half the plate and um, gave it to the person who, who was in and who was hungry. Um, so I suppose as I said I was born in Ireland. Um, I live in Northern Ireland now for about seven years and I suppose while it's on the island of Ireland and I suppose you know there is a complex history um, in Northern Ireland and while I might have only moved 200 miles up the road, um, driving over an invisible border that, you know, all of a sudden things change from miles to kilometres. Uh, the signage change, changes slightly. Other than that, really, there, you know, my I made assumptions around values and things that they speak the same language. It's pretty much the same thing. But it is quite different. Um, even just the, the, the look and feel of, of, of cities and towns uh, looks quite different. Um, I have had a few experiences um, in my teenage years because I would have played a lot of sports. And during the Troubles, I suppose, um, there was a lot of conflict resolution um, programs happening. And we were, I played soccer. Um, yeah, I think everybody on this would call it soccer. Uh, UK people call it football, but because, you know, we have American football, we have Gaelic football, so I'm just going to stick with soccer. So I played um, soccer and we were often bussed up to Northern Ireland um, and hosted in the middle of Belfast in the Shankill Road, which is a Protestant community. So you can just imagine a bunch of 14, 15 year olds up here. Um, so we had a lot of experiences, uh, good and bad and indifferent, but it was definitely those kind of invisible borders and, and the different values that you kind of experience in relation to um, different societies and whatnot. Um, and I suppose thinking back of my childhood as well around um, education, I went to an all-girls school. I suppose the two, besides my mother being the most influential person, the two other female um, females that had such a, an impact on my life would have been my two, would have been two female teachers that I had, and while they would have been very very different, both of them would have been very compassionate and and really made you reflect a lot and think a lot about your learning. And I probably didn't think about it at the time when I was in school, but I mean I chose to become um, a PE and maths teacher, and they were my PE it was the PE and maths teacher for me. So having that much influence um, on my career choice uh, for a number of years, for me, that's very significant that those two females had such um, an influence on me. Um, I suppose I moved into teacher ed then for a number of years and I'm currently writing up my PhD. And it's really funny because my PhD started a number of years ago. Unfortunately, it took a lot longer than uh, I anticipated. But I'm in the right up stage and I would say like it's, our, it, it's on meaningful engagement in out of school learning environments. Um, I did not know what UDL was um, at the time, but now it's really funny because of my current role that I'm in. Writing my findings, writing my discussion chapter and just UDL is jumping out in all aspects um, of my research. And it's just really funny because I'm developing a framework for out of school learning environments um, that will hopefully affect uh, policy change. But it's just huge parts of that framework is all around universal design for learning. Um, and which is really, really interesting. Like I, I some of my research happened in Pittsburgh in America, and then I did a comparative study in Limerick in Ireland. And 
two of them focused on a social model and it was what worked in there while the context was very different there was a lot more money um, in the context in, in the states versus the one in Ireland um, so the, the physical building and the, the facilities and things like that but the way the staff, the relationship that they had with the with the learners, the flexibility and choice that was offered, um, the learning that occurred, it was just you know it, it was everything there around UDL, um, how you know, co-creation of design, things like that. It was a huge aspect and element around um, inclusive learning design, and I think it's funny that I've ended up you know I've continued in that area, I've continued in that role. Um, and I suppose my current role at the moment um, in Queen's University um, is all around, like I am an EDI champion um, and lots of the areas and research that I carry out. So I would provide one-to-one -one support, but equally a much larger uh, cross-institutional support um, and inform and guidance and policy. So my areas are accessibility, universal design for learning, social justice, um, sustainable um, curriculum and intercultural competence and it's just funny how I've ended up there and I've never really left it but I suppose when I even was starting my PhD I didn't you know I was looking at meaningful engagement in general but how I've ended up where I've ended up is just quite interesting for me and I suppose that comes back to personable for me is the values that that I always that was embedded in me from from my my youth um, and that those values haven't really changed much and I was looking, I was thinking about values a lot and I was thinking about like the, what are the values in our institution and, and what does that mean for staff? Like what does that mean for you? Uh, so, you know, everybody has their own values and their family values. But then when you work in, in an environment or an institution, they also have um, values and also include equally have values. And I was looking what the include values were versus our, our values in our institution. And there's one, there's some comparable, but both have connect and connected. Um, and I think that's absolutely key. So, I mean, the first, you know, um, principle like engagement, like, you know, the why of the learning, um, you're really making that connection with the educators, with one another, with the topic and things like that. So I think really the connection for me is, is really something that I do try to drive institutionally and building those learning communities. Um, and finding people, um, I suppose you kind of, it's easier to find someone with similar values. You, you start off because you can kind of draw people in immediately, but then you try to pull in other people um, and try to find out, you know, add to their values and bring them in in terms of working together and driving the, the framework around um, universal design for learning. So I just I just wanted to give a bit of a, my history um, and my story around how I've ended up um, because for me I was only introduced to UDL around two years ago and I've you know been on a steep learning curve since and I suppose in relation to and I know Christina called this out about um, you know the various global issues um, that are happening at the moment obviously COVID, Black Lives Matter, um, climate change another you know, tree 2020 is a year that we're just not going to forget um anytime soon um and i've been thinking about that like what does that mean for us because i know um tresha Fitzger fitzgerald has just a new book out udl um and anti-racism and the most recent um conference around udl um the udl rising which is you know moving the framework in that in, in another direction and, I, and that's what I really like about the framework is the flexibility of the framework um, and I suppose when I deal with staff sometimes I tend to not show them the whole framework because it can be quite overwhelming I kind of focus like what Tobin talks about um, the one the plus one kind of concept so if you're doing something you know you're just adding or you're drawing in other aspects and that's the way that's the way I would work so I suppose the question with thinking about you and your values um, basically how like how can we cross borders um and developing and pushing forward the values around the udl um framework thanks sean oh uh, thank you so much tracy it's it's it was lovely to hear your story it really was and i i didn't know the half of it so uh <laughs> Um, and what resonated with me as you began to speak was um, how, to some extent, when when you kind of discovered the framework, as it were, that it 
totally resonated that it, pro- yeah. it, it, it provided an anchor to some extent for a, a conceptual framework that enabled you to, to ground those experiences that you'd had at, as an educator and your own personal experience as well. And, and to some extent, that's universal. That's where kind of a uh, an inner city limerick uh, ed- educator person, female, uh, can find values that actually resonate with you in 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 a framework that you know has been generated somewhere else in a different context and whatever else, but it resonates. And I have to say, also as an Irish person, that I found that the values base. Uh, underpinning the the framework for universal design for learning also really resonated with me as an educator and to some extent um, as somebody who's passionate about the elements that you had identified equality diversity and inclusion edi um, that that it, it it provides a language as david was talking about earlier on it provides a shared vocabulary and it provides an anchor for your for your conceptual uh, thinking and interrogating of where you're coming from and just when you were speaking as well i was i was really struck by its application not only in the contexts of disability which you know traditionally it it has um, applied to but also in relation to people like yourself who 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 are what we call first generation uh, educators and you know I'm aware when you were speaking I was thinking of Mustafa and hopefully Mustafa is out there he might be able to jump in and his experiences as somebody growing up in a village in in Morocco and I think he also kind of when he um, came upon the the framework also had that sense of oh this is something that I can grab and is meaningful uh, for me so I think if we can Keep those ideas and and research what they actually mean as we transverse borders and break those, some of those borders down because I think what borders create and when we recreate borders, it can create fear and mistrust. Um, so if we can kind of work on <laughs> our shared humanity ultimately and our shared sense of um, of of the value of other individuals and other cultures and what that means in a meaningful way. We have about 10 minutes left. And what I'd like to do, thank you so much, Tracy. That was, again, really, uh, it complemented the the tapestry of uh, stories that we've had uh, throughout the afternoon. Um, What I'd like to do is to open it out a little bit and to ask other, uh, we've had 31 people who started uh, the session. We still, we now have 33 That's unusual. It's unusual to hold an audience all the way through. So thank you to the presenters. You've captivated our audience. It might be a small audience, but it's quite select. And um, and obviously, uh, you know. John, I think people could raise their hands. um, Yeah. Okay, Richard, that's a good idea. That's a question, and then you could uh, you could call on on them. I, I also uh, had a couple of concluding remarks, but I but I think there's still time to to have some response from the gathering here. Absolutely. So I don't know if the, if people have that actual function of raising their hands. Do they do they have that function, Richard? I believe they I don't think so. All right. Oh, okay. I, no, I I can't, I can't see that either. Um, so uh, However, you, what, you can just uh, unmute your mic and maybe speak up. We'll just pause for a bit. Um, can I ask something? Please. You... Oh, hi, yeah. <laughs> um, it's Dirna, yeah. So I, I just thought it's interesting that because, because I'm, actually, I'm actually editing a, a book about um, inclusive learning design, and I have 60 contributors. Actually, some of them are here. Um, but, but that's one thing I have been wondering because, because of course, I have to set the, the, the context and introduce all this uh, wealth of uh, ideas. Um, and one thing that resonates now in this webinar and I've been thinking about is this thing, well, how do you actually um, reconcile, you know, something very global um, because, because the world has become so interconnected. Um, and, I mean, I've got IKEA, uh, 30 minutes from here, and I'm in Italy right now, and I had IKEA, you know, 20 minutes from my house in London, and then I went to 
visit a friend in, you know, of course, Sweden. And there was like, so it's like, so the, we're so global. But then on the other hand, it's just an example. <laughs> on the other hand, uh, we obviously want to personalize and um, uh, value um, individual context and needs. So it, there is a real tension. I think it, it's, it's actually very difficult, especially at a time when education is becoming so, uh, it's, it's mass um, education. Well, well, IKEA is a wonderful example. Yes. Uh, and and he, here's why. Um, I think that um, people come to UDL and they actually undergo a transform, transformational experience. They they see it and they go, wow, that's really the answer. That's that's what it's all about. And it's kind of like with when you want to furnish your home, you you can go to IKEA, go to the catalog, or go to the factory and pick out what you want, and you can put it together yourself, and you can personalize your your living arrangement based on these furniture arrangements that you can construct yourself. So teachers for the first time come to UDL and they say, we don't really have to have a one size fits all curriculum. We really can pay attention to the differences in students and not look to diagnose these differences and look for fixes, but rather we can personalize our learning environment, make it, we can design for flexibility. We can design with the affordances in mind. So I, I think the IKEA is a, is a great example. Mm-hmm. And great I think the IKEA, IKEA is a good example for another reason as well. And I think it might have been you, Mustafa, who told me about IKEA in, uh, it might be in Casablanca. Was, is that, do you know that story? You'll have to unmute your, your mic there. Uh, I, I remember we talked about IKEA. We have just one IKEA in Casablanca, but I don't remember the whole story. But just uh, just going back to you, you, you mentioning uh, that, that, that I came from a village. So if I could just carry on on that, if you allow me, Sean, yeah? I will, but very briefly, I'm going to finish the IKEA story first, because not only does IKEA... Uh, provide that customer experience where you can kind of choose whichever design you wish. It, it can also be a little bit culturally transformative. And I think what, what, what occurred in the IKEA in uh, Casablanca was that they purposefully hired um, many of their customer care personnel uh, from the community of people with disabilities in Morocco. And so it, it actually transformed in terms of visibility and uh, in, in working from acceptance to actually recognizing that people with disabilities have had a really valuable role to play in relation to, in relation to that customer experience, that real life experience, and how to some extent that helped to change society ever so slightly but importantly so looking at people's roles um within you know within the service industries and beyond as well over to you yeah absolutely mustafa sorry to interrupt there but yeah no, no thank you very much sean just going back to coming from a small village yeah indeed i come from a small uh, olive uh, village olive tree village similar to verna's that verna showed me the, the picture where, where where she lives at the moment in italy so, but talking about universal design, I remember when we were small, the, the, there was a, a role for everyone. So the culture were, was in a way universally designed. So we have, we have something for, that fits for each one, taking care for each one in their own, uh, in their own right and for their own needs. What I feel, uh, well, just again, at first, this is not academic, what I feel is that nowadays there is that lack of selfishness, even when we talk about UDL from an academic perspective. Well, it's about, it's about personal needs of each one, but there is less much talk about how, how those needs can interact and how, how selfishness can help as well uh, in, in terms of one, one, uh, uh, what, I mean, how, 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 how can selfishness help as well, uh, uh, induce collaborativeness, induce, uh, because what, the way we, we, we were brought up is, 
is you have to make room for the needs of each one rather than just uh, like nowadays, I'm, I'm talking about students like nowadays in some parts of Morocco. It's about what's in it for me? What, what should I get? What's, what are my rights? And what are, fair enough. But th- th- I think we should encourage as well that spirit of selfishness. Yeah. Thank Great. Yeah, that's Th- thank you. Thank you. And I think that's a, a really good place perhaps for us to finish up for this evening. I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave the very last word with Richard because he, he, uh, he launched it. Um, but thank, thank everybody. Thank you so much. And I think, again, Mustafa, thanks to you and to colleagues at the University of Ibn Zor. And in relation to uh, leaving us with that particular challenge to perhaps reinterrogate what our values are, our core values, and to reach out and uh, towards selflessness. I think that's, again, that's a part of a, a universal call uh, that would resonate quite well with the uh, universal design for learning framework. But I'm going to pass over to my colleague Richard over in uh, Boston College, who um, kind of facilitated stuff and I want to thank all of my colleagues over there in Boston College in particular Christopher the the techie guy behind this because um, he anticipated everything and thankfully you know all has gone quite smoothly but thanks in particular to all of the presenters and to everyone who's come along and stayed with us uh, for this afternoon just a very enriching discussion and very challenging discussion as well but Richard over to yourself. Well, I would just add to what Sean said. Thank you, colleagues, and thank you, participants. I noticed some of my students uh, came on board today. I was really glad to see that. Um, Really glad to uh, that uh, that Mustafa was able to uh, share some of his experiences. This really is Mustafa's uh, conference to start with. I want to thank him for uh, for uh, having us come in. The only thing I I would uh, I wanted to add was that um, I would like you, like everybody to think about UDL as a, as a major paradigm shift. For decades, we've been thinking about individual differences and diagnosing individual differences and arranging people in tracks and in classrooms and thinking about uh, a curriculum that would fit the majority. And what we've heard today was, regardless of whether you're in Sweden or you're in Chile, uh, you're in Northern Ireland, Ireland, isolation, segregation, low expectations, stigmatization, all of the attention to differences has caused hordes of people for decades to suffer, suffer inopportunity. And this what we're seeing now is a global movement toward in- inclusion with UDL as a guiding framework. So people are, people, what you've heard are stories from around the world today where people are talking about their own personal transformation, how they said they see it and they said, I get it. It's, and that's what it's about. So um, I said, and somebody else said in the chat that this is really, a, glo- a, a global implementation, but uh, local with, with, I'm sorry, a global framework, global perspective with local implementation. So uh, thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of the day. Some of you have less of a day than I do ahead. So all the best. Thank you.